have here um, and let you all know that you know one of the things that I really enjoy about this show and these artists in particular is they, they all possess a quality that um, I really like to see in art and artists and that is when I look at their art and I know the artist I see, I see the artist in the art, I see the person in the art. If you have ever met Patty or know Patty at all, you, you can look at this work and you see this incredible exuberance um, for it. You see her, um, the scientific background, you know, Patty is a forester, you see the, that, that precision there. You see, as she refers to data sets in there, um, and a lot of a lot of information is conveyed in this, in, in both a scientific and kind of analytical manner. She also has a background in finance, um, and but more than anything, it's that explosive personality that I see, and that's something I really appreciate about Patty and her work here. So that that's always a sign of a true artist, and and the same the same goes with um, Marcel's work. Um, when you see these sculptures, there's a you can see that love of nature, you can see the observation, and there's a sweetness and a tenderness in in the work um, that uh, and a softness to it. And, and again, I, I see that and appreciate that in her. Um, and then finally, Brian, who we're going to he'll be the first speaker to come up tonight. Um, Brian um, is. His work, Brian does something I, I rarely see, and he, he invents shapes. He, he's working in a medium that's perhaps one of the oldest in history. You know, he's working with natural materials, with clay, um, but he brings something new to it, and that's quite an achievement, especially in, in that field. Um, and uh, also, Brian, having a background in graphic design, um, he too brings a a precision to a medium that can be um, lean towards the fluid side, but there's a precision there with his shapes and his forms, and then there's also this two-dimensional quality that sort of comes through on, on the face of it. So he, he does an incredible job of sort of blending the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional in a very elegant way. So um, I think that's about all I have. I think we'll, Brian will come up first, and then Marcel, and then we will we'll finish off with, with Patty. So here you go, Brian. I don't really have to say anything because he just sort of summed it all up. Thank you very much. Um, well, I did make notes this time, but I'm going to try and fly without them. Um, I wanted to say first that I, I'm actually always a little envious of painters, Patty and others, because when you put paint down, you kind of see what you get. There was a phrase in early technology called WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get. And you put it down, and you pretty much know, and then you can mess with it as much as you want. But with clay, it's, um, it's kind of, uh, when you open a kiln, it can either be like Christmas Day, or kind of like Forrest Gump, you know, you open a box of chocolates and you never really know what you're going to get. And so sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Or you have to let the kiln have its way with your work. And I work in a, in a firing technique that's, uh, everything I do is fire an electric kiln, which is probably the most controlled uh, environment of all the firing processes. There's gas, which is very atmospheric, and there's carbon that goes in the kiln, and, and wood firing is the most uncontrollable of the batch and it's a real good look but um, it's, it's hard to know what you're going to get out the other end. Um, not have to refer. <laughs> so, wood fire, one of the things that is aesthetic about it is something you may have all heard the term wabasabi, which is basically the, the aesthetic that appreciates imperfection. Laws and I respect that and I love that and I aim for that in my work and I try and make that happen with the glazes, but I have this very precise tendency, so I've kind of tried to con combine those two with um, everything I everything starts on a potter's wheel. Even my altar shapes start on a potter's wheel. And I'm absolutely precise. The form is very important to me, the shape, the balances, the ratios, a lot of that's coming from a design background. Um, 
but the glaze is where I let those two merge. So there's the tight shape, very controlled, but then the glaze has more randomness to it. So kind of a cross. I, I jokingly call it uh, uh, modern primitive, my work is sort of this contrast of style and meaning. So, speaking to that, um, as Andrew mentioned, I have a background in graphic design. So, worked for design firms for over 30 years, so have that whole two-dimensional thing going on. But I've had a hand in play since high school, really, and I'm not going to tell you how many I think it's a hell of a long time. And, uh, and have always loved it and always kept my hand in it. I've worked in different cities um, doing graphic design. Um, and I really believe that there's a real crossover between those disciplines, uh, ratios and balances and color forms and things of that nature that you work out two dimensionally, totally translated into three dimensions as well. And uh, a lot of my inspiration has come from all kinds of design, product design, industrial design, fashion. Um, you know, there are those balances. And in some ways, pottery is uh, ceramics has been there's an anthropomorphic quality to, to vessels, thrown vessels specifically. And I love playing with that um, aspect of it. So that's another thing. I thought the fashion industry is kind of interesting. <coughs> like a coat or a shirt hanging on somebody in the balances. I see some of that as well. So really, my inspirations come from all kinds of places. I mean, I, of course, love natural things, natural colors, and I think most ceramic American studio potters or studio artists in clay have to always have some allegiance to Eastern and Asian ceramic influence. It's just inevitable. Um, it's had such an influence. So I have this cross between appreciation of that and trying to incorporate that in my work, but also, like I say, inspiration from you know a gear, a hunk of rusty gear on an old boat or a war handle or a, a World War II airplane. I mean, I'm always looking for shapes and things that, uh, you know, balance that appeal to me. So, okay, I will. I'm done just about. <laughs> um, one other thing I going to share. I lost it. But so, I, but anyway, so just as a for instance, on some of the pieces that we can see, is there any you could tell us a story about uh, inspiration for those shapes or designs? Sure. Um, how much time I got left? We're fine. We're not worried. Um, well, the ones I'll point out. Um, there's a new thing I've been trying. It's, it's if you've ever heard of or done fatigue. There's wax resist where you apply wax and then pour or brush something over and then the pattern of the wax is what's left behind. There's a couple of smaller pieces that I brought this time that um, I'm playing around with that where I put a black on first and then do the brushwork, wax brushwork, and then pour or dip this in what I call a lightning glaze. It's a crackle glaze over the top and just let that wet. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so um, having fun with that. Um, this shape actually, and there's some that are much flatter than this, I call these wedge shapes. Everything I do starts out round on a potter's wheel. And then if you look at the ones that are really compressed, they'll start as a round uh, cylinder basically with no bottom. And then I cut them free of the wheel and start gently compressing them to where they get flat. And part of that was an aesthetic reason of my 2D stuff coming out. I wanted a surface I could paint on. I mean, you can paint on a three-dimensional round piece, but I wanted a flatter surface to start exploring. Um, and part of it was more of a pragmatic concern. A lot of people love my work, but it's, the round ones are too wide for their mantle or too wide for the space they have. So then, well, maybe these flat ones have a practical aspect too. So that's a direction. I'm going. But 
But again, everything starts out round and then gets altered or assembled. I'm starting some pieces. I don't have any finished here for the show, but uh, where I'm cutting the pieces away, we sort of deconstructed pieces. So that's something new. So thank you. Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> we only get one. <laughs> it into a work of art. And since wood comes from trees, I want to say a few words about trees. You hear uh, people who talk to trees. Well, when I'm around a tree, the tree is the one that does the talking, and I just listen. And I've learned a lot by listening to trees. One of the things I've learned is the importance of being fully present right where you are. Trees are very good at that. They don't have a choice, they can't move. And being present is an important part of sculpture because every sculpture needs to convey a sense of presence that speaks to the observer. So, you know, that's gonna be different for everybody because each of us interprets things in our own way. I can't tell you what a sculpture means any more than I can tell you what a tree in the forest means. It depends on who we each bring to it. Now, each of you will bring to a work of art your own life experience, your emotions, and it will respond to you based on what you bring to it. And that conversation can only happen when you allow yourself to be fully present. Now the second thing I want to say about trees is that they provide what I call a space of grace. And again, that's something that it's hard to put into words, exactly what that means. But you know it when you feel it. It's kind of a, a sense of release, of just being allowed to just be being acknowledged without judgment. And I like to make my sculptures provide that sense of grace. So that you can feel that kind of sigh of relief. That kind of just for a moment of just being. So that sense of grace. I think with a world that seems to be in such turmoil, so much conflict and negativity, it's really important for us to find the things that allow us to connect with that inner tranquility that we all do have, but sometimes gets lost. And art can help us to reclaim a relationship with things that seem lost. Then a few words about the creative process. There's a word I associate with this that's called blessedness. And I found a definition once in a dictionary of this word that was very helpful. It said, blessedness is an inner fountain of joy in the soul itself. An inner fountain of joy in the soul itself. You know, that is what drives the creative process. That is the source of the inspiration, of the energy, that demands that what we feel inwardly has to be expressed outwardly. And that's why artists do what we do. In my expression of that, it involves a partnership with a piece of wood. And all my work, well, most of it is done in just one block of wood. And there are basically two ways that can happen. It can either be a wood that has already some sort of shape to it that makes me think what might be there. 
or it can be just a block of wood with no particular shape that then I have an idea and I think, what do I want to create there? Now in the first case, burl wood usually has its own interesting shapes already, irregular. So that will suggest to me something. And for example, two of the pieces in this show, the two octopus pieces, are both burl wood that already have some kind of shape that suggested to me what those need to become. So then I take myself to the aquarium. Seattle Aquarium is just a short walk from where I live. And I observe an octopus. And what I'm looking for is shape. I, in, in my sculpture, I don't try to duplicate an exact animal or bird, do it all in detail. I just care about creating the basic shape. And so you'll know what it is, but it won't, it won't have a lot of detail. It's the form. And wood is great at that, and especially girl wood, which already has some kind of shape to it. And trees in the forest have curves and shapes. So I like to have that reflected in the sculpture. Even when I sometimes do a sculpture that has straight lines or an angle, um, somewhere in there there's going to be a curve, something that suggests shape. So, um, so that's, that's one kind where the shape is already suggested to me by the wood. The other is where I have an idea and then I look for a piece of wood that allows me to create that. So that may be just a, a block. And the other things here are examples of that. One I wanted to mention particularly was the, the frog, which is in the back there. Um, that one started because I was in the zoo, and one of the uh, exhibits there, behind the glass, had this little red frog about, about this size to the little one. But it had such a wonderful little bulbous fat shape that he just called out to be a sculpture. And so I went home and thanks to the internet, now with Google, you can go and see images for a red frog. <laughs> and then it gives me lots of pictures. And so what I do then, I bring this, uh, yes. So I will print out a few, like here's Six images for a red frog. That happened to be a, a, a frog from Madagascar. That's why I call it Madagascar, that little frog. Well, I wanted to do it big, not, not the tiny little one. And I wanted that bulbous shape. So I look for a piece of wood, and I want it red, so I have red cedar. And I find a nice piece of wood, and then I begin working. Now, I don't use a model. I just keep in my mind what I want to do. I want to use a picture to give me some memory of what the shape is. And then I will begin working with the wood to, to get that shape until I got it done. And then I get my sandpaper out. And sometimes I can spend more time sanding something than I do carving it because it matters to me that the texture. One thing about wood is that wonderful sensuous kind of smoothness that you can get with a piece of wood. That's one of the joys of working with it, is that texture. So I work for that. So that's the, the two kinds of ways I work that I wanted to share with you. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the grain of wood. Because that's unique to, to working in wood is the grain that also is part of the finished look. And I brought a couple of different pieces of wood to, to talk about grain. But first, I, I want to mention the fragrance because that's another part of the wood. And the wood I'm going to show you actually is, I think, the most fragrant wood there is. It's a kind of cedar, but all cedars are, are fragrant. And I work in my little studio is in a building where there are other artists of various kinds. And I move the doors so they they come past my place a lot, and people will comment on the wonderful fragrance that's drifting out of my studio because of the, the wood that I work with. And it's, it's great to be embraced in that uh, element of, of that wonderful fragrance. 
So the one that I'm going to talk about in terms of grain is Cordorford cedar, which, as I said, this is the most fragrant of all woods that I'm aware of. And the reason I'm using it as an example is because I want to talk about the difference between old growth, wood from an old growth forest, which is no longer available, and second growth or newer kinds of wood. Port Orford, as many of you probably know, is a town in southern Oregon. It's the only place in the world where that particular kind of cedar grows naturally. Unfortunately, because it is such value, the wood has pretty much been logged to extinction. So there are more old growth forest left. But occasionally, there are pieces of wood that come available from having been cut down years ago. And I have a cousin who lived on the Oregon coast and gave me a piece that he found that washed up on the beach. Um, just a chunk of it. And this is one piece from it that I kept to show that you can hardly see the grain in it. It's so tight. And it's just a dream to carve that kind of wood. Beautiful piece of wood. Then I also have some newer Port Orford cedar that I use. And this, the grain lines are about a quarter inch apart. That's the difference between what you used to get and what you get now. I'm not going to pass this around, but um, if you're interested, you know, ask me about it later and I'll let you see it up close. I've got this, this larger piece, this is the newer kind. Maybe you can see clear there how far apart the grain lines are. So this is like gold to me, this, this old wood that just can't get any more. Um, there are two sculptures made out of this that I have now, and one of them is the pelican, which is right over there. And the other one is in the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art in an exhibit there. Um, you can also still smell the fragrance of this. It's most fragrant when you're just working on it when it's cut. You still tell. So I think uh, I think I'll just see if you have any questions. Yes. Me again. Um, uh, how about Alaskan yellow cedar? That's wonderful. That because that's exciting. still available. I bought actually a beautiful piece right over here from these guys right in their shed uh, a few months or maybe a year ago. But. Uh -huh. So I, that's available in old growth still. Yes, yes. I have quite a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> this forest, yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. The thing about my work that is a bit of a challenge is that I can't use boards because I need a chunk. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a chunk takes a long time to cure enough mm -hmm. so that you can work with it without having it have splits and cracks and so forth. So that's why I'm excited when I find something really old that's been around long enough and dry enough that I can use it because you can't get it from lumber yards because they have boards. Yeah, it's, it's rarely is wood milled in those really large, those really big thicknesses. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I'll say one reason I love this gallery is because it's owned by people who work in wood. <laughs> and they understand and value wood. So I was so excited when I discovered this, this gallery here and got to show in it. Any other questions? Sure. Um, uh, so, uh, the tools you use? Yes. I use a chisel, many different chisels. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I was working on something the other day, I had about eight chisels out and every five seconds I'd be using a different one depending on what I was trying to do. Um, chisel and mallet. <coughs> also, I have a dentist drill for Mm -hmm. It has different bits on it. Um, uh, well, rasps and files. Yeah. That's basically it. Can you, can you say something about how you started? I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice to allergies. Mm -hmm. How you get, got started as an artist? Um, uh, I started as a child just loving the little way of things. Mm -hmm. And then I would do things, uh, maybe just a little gift for somebody, just kind of insignificant little things. And then at 
at one point I did something that was a little more significant, so I began to show in a gallery in Seattle many years ago. And I just did it, I, the wood really has been my teacher. It, and, and then for a long time I had other things that I needed to do that took me away from this work. So it's in the last five years I've been able to come back to it full time. Any other questions? Okay. Hey, okay, I just need to get props. So my name is Patty Haller, and I'm the oil painter. And um, I'm just so thrilled to be back here. Seeing all my paintings on the walls, I've uh, been associated with this gallery, I think, for about three years now, and it's just been really fun. I've made a lot of friends, and I really admire the way the galleries run, and the arts communities, and the Skagit Valley. It's all been a really great experience. Um, and I'd like to echo what Marcel said about um, loving the association with the wood. It's so much fun to go over to the shed if you haven't been there, make sure. Do. Um, so I do have notes that I'll try to not refer to often. Um, I grew up in Seattle. I'm fourth generation Seattleite. I got a couple degrees from the University of Washington. The first was in forest resources and then I worked as a forester for a while and went back uh, to get my MBA um, with the thought that I'd go back into the timber industry. Um, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, I was hired by uh, Anderson Consulting, which is was part of Arthur Anderson at the time, and is now called Accenture. There's always so many changes. Uh, and they had hired me to work on a warehouse or strategic plan to write up my alley, but that fell through and they sent me to Nordstrom. <laughs> so I never really <laughs> went back in the timber industry, but, um, but there were certain things about the timber industry that um, that stayed with me. My first job as a forester was to be a timber cruiser, and that involves going out in the woods and doing what's basically a statistical sample of, of the trees so that you can extrapolate what the, um, what the entire forest has. You can do these timber cruises for for various reasons, if you want to know your species mix on your land, or more commonly, you want to end up with a stumpage value. So I spent a lot of time in the woods, but um, I guess unlike Marcel, I didn't. I was going into it from the forest products uh, perspective, and also knowing that I had a lot of ground to cover every day. So it didn't really allow me to just sort of sit quietly. But one thing I did notice when I was out in the woods, um, we'd measure the trees, I was always working with a partner, and if you get finished sooner than your partner, you can go sit on a log and sort of clean up your notes. And, and I noticed that was always the time that I felt uh, like I really loved my job. I'd hear all birds, and there'd be a lot of movement with the tree boughs coming, and, blocking the light, opening the light. It just felt like everything was kind of glittering in my peripheral vision, and I always uh, really liked that. So I um, went back and got my MBA, uh, finance and accounting, uh, took the CPA exam because I had to squeeze in before they required you to have a degree in accounting. Thankfully, I did, because I'm really good at taking tests. Um, and. Uh, that is when I started working uh, more as a systems analyst and a financial analyst. So the, the second job experience besides that sensation of their budgets, and um, they could be significant. So we had like a $250 million uh, capital budget. And this was when I was in the cellular industry, and another $130 million operating budget. And so my job, <laughs> was to work with the executives and make sure they were on track and uh, help them understand their past results, estimate their future results, 
and then work with them on the strategic plan. So, so from that work experience, I really became pretty facile with, with asking what if questions and sort of going back into uh, data sets of information and just taking a different cut at the data. And my guess is there's probably a lot of people in this room who've had professional jobs where you're doing somewhat of the same thing. So I do find that it's pretty easy for me to talk to people about data sets and dashboards and benchmarks and, uh, and all of that. What's different is uh, most of my artist friends don't know about it, don't talk about it. Um, and it's really what I'm trying to do in these paintings. So for the first few years I painted, um, I thought of the description of I'm creating order out of chaos. And I tell people about how I go into the woods and I have all this experience and I like do my machinations and, uh, and get things arranged on the panels. But then that became very unsatisfying to me because it didn't feel like I was describing to myself what I was doing because I felt that nature has its own natural order and that all these plants are growing in response to what their resources are, what is their light, what's their water situation, Did, is this tree seedling lucky enough to have its roots in an old cedar log or is it uh, stuck over there competing for resources with the alder or you know what all the ways that the plants are shaped and how they interact with each other in space has everything to do with their situation and not my understanding of order or chaos they don't feel like they're chaotic it's just the human going in and feeling that this is chaos or at least I thought that's what it was. So, so I've kind of been mulling that in my mind for the past few years. Uh, every time I do a big body of work, I'll take an art history class. So a few years ago, I, I took a couple courses in um, Northern Renaissance art history and, um, and loved it. And one of the themes that comes through is in the Northern Renaissance, there was a great love of botanical detail in the art. Um, and that appealed to me. Um, sometimes the plants were included because they were important for medicinal purposes or for the culture, or there might even be superstitions around the plants. Um, and, but they ended up on the panel paintings. So that appealed to me. Um, also, I was sort of surprised to learn that in the Northern Renaissance, when the um, artists made the panels, there was somewhat of a formula and the artist would work with the patron to decide what was going to be on the panel. What's your budget? What is this wood going to be made of? Um, what is the preparation? How much preparation is going to be? What pigments are required? Like there may be a minimum amount specified for lapis lazuli because the patron, if they were going to pay money, they'd want to make sure they got their quality ingredients. Um, and then there were these pattern books in the workshops of um, like here, here's a page in the pattern book that has hands in various forms and, and the artist can say, do you want the virgin's hands to be folded or open, you know, the press child in here and, and oh, by the way, you have room for the patron family on either side. Do you want that first wife who died? in the painting or to just want your second wife. Uh, I mean, there were all these decisions to make. And I, that kind of blew me away because I had grown up, or not grown up, but learned art at age, sort of, I guess, really influenced by the 20th century that it was this, this process of battling, you know, painting was sort of a battle or that it, that wasn't so much gauge, that was more studying abstract expressionism on my own, but it gauged the classical method that we would be perceiving what we see in front of us and we build these layers slowly. And then I find out in the Northern Renaissance that these guys were like little businessmen uh, defining the contract. And, and at first I was disappointed, but then I thought, hey, <laughs> they're room for me. So, <laughs> so I sort of took that on and that's the approach I do take to the panels, that they 
there, not that I need to talk with anybody about what's involved, but I do ask myself, um, you know, what are the different components? If I'm going to have these plants here, is there room for this other plant here? And, and I really plan, plan it out. Um, another uh, course I took recently was on um, Art Nouveau across Europe. And I had always thought of Art Nouveau as being like the Breck girl with the <laughs> curls and those Alphonse Mucha <coughs> um, posters in Paris with, yeah, just all of the hair. And, or peacocks with, you know, the beautiful jewels. Um, that was Art Nouveau for me. But in this course, I, had, um, I learned a lot more about the Germans and the Austrians and, and also the English and how their art fit in that uh, time period. And so it was still art and vogue, but they had their own take on it. And, and I had known about this before, and I had admired the Universitate. But I, uh, it was just interesting to study the art history and, and see that context. So this body of work, I would say, reflects both my interest in the Northern Renaissance and in um, and in Art Nouveau as interpreted by the more of the Germanic <coughs> uh, countries. Uh, so I had mentioned the, the Alphonse Mucha crazy hair. There's also the Paris Metro, um, what do you call that, like the entrance gate that is remarred and, and also, so the French is very tendrils and the Germans and the Austrians sort of define a geometric, geometric shape and then they've got the tendrils and things within that geometric shape. Um, and they have a concept of Gesamt Kunst's work, which is that uh, total body of work where uh, things are uh, comprehensive as a whole, in the artwork of art is comprehensive, but you can drill down and all the details are beautiful. They also build up into the whole work to um, be cohesive and harmonious. Um, and the work of these um, Germans and Austrians during this time period was often really high levels of craft. So that really appealed to me. And I decided to take that concept of the sound work seriously in the, in the movies panels as well, that it works cohesively as a whole. But then I, you can drill down and have all this, these shapes which kind of reminds me of those, um, the dashboards I used to make as a financial analyst, that you'd have these, these overall metrics, but then you could drill down and see the spreadsheets that would sort of let you build up to the overall. Um, and that really appealed to me. So the art of that period also for the Germans and the Austrians was about improving people's lives. And in England, with William Morris, there was even a very strong um, current of everybody deserves to have art in their lives and it isn't something just for the rich um, and that appeals to me too that everybody could have their lives improved by being surrounded by art um, let's see uh, so give with i guess because they gave me 18 months between shows here i have a lot of time to do all this studying and experimenting. I decided to work on my color, and I decided instead of looking at uh, paintings from art history to work on my color, I would look at artifacts like uh, textiles from Peru or um, Frank Gehry's kitchen. I really liked that one. And I do these color charts, and I always put these up on Instagram, People seem to really like them. Find Frank Gehry's kitchen first. <coughs> there it is. So um, working on color by looking at objects that aren't made of pigments that I can just go to the store and say, oh, red carmine, that was, that's what I need. Um, it has really, I think, improved my sense of color. I did look at some paintings. This is from a Persian miniature painting. But more often, I was looking at textiles. Um, the Meiji period textile, which also uh, figures into Art Nouveau, um, the, the Japanese were uh, starting to trade with Europe. And 
they uh, did incredible crafts that were sold and the Europeans were crazy about them. And, and I love that. Uh, the Japanese actually used it as a way to come out of a feudal background where they were very inwardly focused to sort of show off their culture and their skills with the Westerners and maybe increase trade. So, um, yeah, very interesting. This is a Norwegian, based on a Norwegian tapestry from the 1800s. And this is a, a Swedish wall hanging, um, also from the 1800s. So I had a lot of fun doing that. Eventually I had to stop because I was sensing this deadline coming up. Um, before I started the paintings though, I did a little bit more uh, experimenting on fabric. I got, um, I found some really great 1970s crafts books at Pelican Bay Books in Anacortes. Um, and this one is called Creative Red Design and it's all total 1970s uh, experimenting and I've got some books with the curved writing. Anyways, I love all that. So I, I, I did some experiments just not really knowing what to do with them, but just sort of out of them. Um, then I set them aside and started working on the panels. So uh, these, I spent a lot of time talking about the background rather than my process, but I think that is important to for me to convey because it's so important that all those thoughts are so important to me when I make my paintings. Um, I like to go into that painting phase before a show, feeling very rich in my thinking so that I don't repeat myself too much. And I'm hoping that people feel that I did that. Um, talk about the Chuck Nut Sisters for a bit. I did a lot of hiking in the Chuck Nuts in Larrabee State Park. Um, and thinking about all these things, the high craft, the Japanese art, um, the Gessant Kunk's work, I thought it would be really cool to try some panels where I was very dense about my data set, <coughs> but uh, try to do a painting that still pulls together in a very clean and modern way. Um, and so that's what these were about. And they nearly killed me in so much work with tiny brushes. And I had a, a hard time. I wouldn't say staying motivated, but because I knew I loved working on them, but, but they were hard. So I got a picture of LeBron James, <laughs> and I put it up on the studio wall. And I thought, you know, LeBron gets all this stuff done with opponents. I don't even have an opponent. It's just me and <laughs> so every time I even like these. It's like you're saying, "Hey, you." And, uh, I admire LeBron. <laughs> I admire Steph Curry too, but he's too fun. You know, I really needed LeBron. Um, another guy I brought in the studio is um, Jurgen Klopp, who is the he is the. Um, coach of Liverpool in the Premier League, and, and it's awesome, you can see right here, he hugs his players, he tells them just all these motivational things. I listen to him on the radio sometimes, and he'll say things like, if, if you could play how I think of you, or, or if you could believe what I believe about you, you would be one of the best players in the world. And I'll say, that's what he's <laughs> so anyways, that's what got me through uh, the Chuck and the Sisters, and, and I'd like to do some more. I just need to give my eyes a little bit of a break. Um, let's see. The, um, another th uh, thing that really came up in making these paintings is us using chance processes and trying to not be so controlling. Um, so I did a lot of experiments, and that line of small paintings is, um, are some experiments that worked out well enough. I continued working on them until they were finished paintings. And so these are paintings where I would take uh, water media and 
drip it and shake it and, you know, just see what kind of shapes I could make of it and then and then make a painting if I felt it was working out. And these studies fed into that large painting that's behind glass. Um, there, you can even see specific little paintings that ended up being like a study for this large painting. But that's all kind of out of my imagination. Um, I was a little bit thinking of the, the folklore I was running into with these Asian textiles I was looking at. Um, let's see. Oh, and then I guess the other person that was important to me in this is Max Ernst, who was a surrealist painter, German, and he also did a lot of chance processes. But he was a very precise uh, artist. And I had been taking German uh, language lessons at the University of Washington. Uh, and I was able to go into the art library and read some of these German texts on Max Ernst. And I just thought uh, the way he painted was very interesting to me. So he would take these chance processes, sometimes just like squishing paper onto a glass plate that was covered with uh, paint. So it sounds like a print, but that's not what he was trying to do. Pull it up and would create all these really interesting shapes, which he then uh, respond to and end up with these very meticulous, beautiful paintings that were sometimes landscapes with these fantastic figures. Um, and I've got a bunch of little Max Ernst type uh, objects in the paintings. Um, all of these little uh, organisms are from chance processes. Um, if you're interested in that, just Anyways, those were the, the biggest things I wanted to tell you, and I hope I haven't gone over time. But if anybody has any questions, I'd love to take them. David. Patty, I love seeing the, the color, um, color plates <coughs> and color studies. Uh, are there any of the ones you showed us actually used, and can you match one to one of the paintings here? Is um, I sort of can because I would always start a painting thinking, oh, there's the Norwegian tapestry palette and that's the one I'm going to use. But then what would always happen is I'd end up just going off a little bit. Um, the, yeah, so I, I think I could probably figure it out, but it would take several minutes. So I'll have to think about that, go through, and maybe we can talk about it during the break. Could you talk a little bit about how you get from the blank canvas? Is that what you use, canvas? Um, wood panels. Wood panel, okay. Then what's the first act that you make? Um, Is it do you begin by sketching what you intend to paint? Or oh, talk um, about that a little bit. Yeah, um, well, for the panel prep itself, are you interested in that or mostly kind of how do I go from a blank? Have just from the blank. Uh, yeah, um, I do. Uh, when I'm out hiking, I'll take photographs, and I have the photographs sort of laying around my studio, and I I play with them and see what's interesting, um, and eventually I'll start thinking. Boy, when I was hiking in the Chuckanuts, this these set of photographs that kind of grab those bright <coughs> leaves against the really shadowy background. That was interesting to me. So I'll start sketching. Um, I don't have it with me, but I'll do these, uh, a whole bunch of different approaches, looking at shapes next to shapes, or looking at lines. I'll do these value studies where I'll take different colors of um, gray and black different values of gray and and see if it's still interesting to me. Sometimes I think subjects are interesting at first because of like a color that pops out of you, but then when you work with it, it's really not that interesting after all. So the value studies are important. Sometimes I'll take casein on watercolor paper and, and do something similar where I'm not trying to get a range of value, but maybe take two complementary colors 
and, and play with that. Anyways, eventually I'll get kind of an idea for the painting. The panels are all wood panels that I get, um, they're sealed and gessoed, and then I'll either go back to my original photo references and, and grid them up and at least do like a partial. I, I never like use the photographs that literally, but if there's a plant that has a lot of personality or whatever, I might grid up that and then grid the panel, just like they teach you to do in art school. But other than that, um, the subject is out of my head. Um, so even ones that look very realistic, I can't show you uh, photographs. Um, the, and then I'm often using water media to start my paintings because it's loose. Um, sometimes I stay longer with the water media. There's a painting over here called Prentice Loves Virginia where I used um, casein paint and just kept using it because it was reminding me of 1950s art history and the Bloedels had a huge art collection. Anyways, I enjoyed doing that, but normally at a certain point I'm kind of anxious to get going on the oils. And the oil over the water media is, is time tested from the Renaissance. It's a really, it's a fun way to work. Um, and I love that tie to art history. Uh, and then I don't know if that answers your question, but, but since it's out of my head, once I get that water media kind of loose composition established and maybe a plant that I've created up, I've got enough information that I can start painting. And, and I might do some chance processes where I dribble paint on them. And that can even be oil paint that's water soluble. Um, and then that starts breaking up the planes. Um, and then I can go in and and treat it like an armature that where I can just start painting the shapes next to the shapes. And then that's where I pull the color charts out and start going full color and looking at the color relationships in oil. Yeah. Is, is, is your water media, are you talking about acrylics? I don't use acrylics. No. Okay. I never have. I use um, casein, which is a milk it's sort of like egg tempera, only it's the binder is uh, milk protein. <coughs> okay. um, and then uh, a gouache. I like using gouache. I, I just use thin layers. Um, gouache has quite a bit more pigment than you'd imagine, so it's actually a really fun uh, media to use, and I find it sits really nicely on the panel and is a nice underpainting. For, for what I do, and it's not um, the way that I learned at Gage, but but there are lots of people who work this way. You can find them on the internet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm Bob Alonzo. <laughs> from Cuba, and now he plays um, center mid for the Seattle Sounders. snacks out in just a few minutes and we'll throw the chairs out and we'll have a little party now. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>